Welcome once again to another episode of the Aussie Wire News. This is our last of four specials that have come out of my trip to the United States. Now, the last three episodes have featured interviews with amazing people that I conducted at the Liberty Con, the Students for Liberty Conference in Washington, D.C. Since then, I've been to another conference, but that was a closed door conference. I, I couldn't bring you any coverage from that. But I've also had opportunities to do many other interesting things. And I want to share one of those with you. People say, well, what's the point of traveling? What's the point of going over to America? Why don't you stay? here and keep covering Australian issues and so forth. And there's definitely a place for that. But one of the main values of me traveling, especially with my recent history during COVID, is the ability to try and help the world hear the story of what myself and, and quite possibly yourself, but certainly many, many amazing people in Melbourne, in Victoria and around Australia did during COVID. The stories of ordinary people who made extraordinary decisions and showed incredible courage to do what was right, even when their government was wrong. I think that's a story that needs to be told, and it's a story that Americans certainly need to hear because, well, if I'm blunt, yes, Americans are up themselves and think that they're the center of the universe, but to a certain degree, they're not wrong. In this sense, if freedom fails in America, if they, if they abandon what's left of their freedom, and let's be honest, they've abandoned a lot of it already, if they lose what remains, it's going to be very difficult to maintain freedom in places like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the UK. If we lose that example that's being set by the US, desperately imperfect though it is, life gets a lot harder for the rest of us. And so one of the reasons I wanted to come to the US on this trip, and I'll be coming back to the US every opportunity I get, is to be able to urge Americans to learn from us to learn from our mistakes, but also to learn from the things that we got right and to prepare themselves so that the next time they get tested, whether it's climate lockdowns or disease X or these various things that we're hearing about, who knows what the future holds, whatever it is, we need them to be ready and willing and able to push back in the right ways and to preserve their freedom. And I think to help them do that, helping them understand what we experienced in Australia is a very valuable thing to do. So what I, what I wanted to share with you today in today's episode of the Aussie Wire News is a session that I got to do with a small number of people invited uh, by uh, someone who's become a very dear friend of mine as a result again of conferences and networking and this sort of thing. And uh, so that's Sam Sorbo and she organized the event that you're about to watch. And what I wanted to do was just to simply let you see that event unfold just see it play out. I'm not going to cast any commentary on it. I just want you to see it. And I want you to think about the implications of who's in that room, of what they're hearing, of what impact those stories might have and how that might actually help the fight for freedom in the grander scheme of things. This is one of the things that uh, you know, I travel for. This is one of the reasons why I do this. And I wanted to share that with you. So please enjoy a front row seat at what was at the time a closed door event in Florida, USA. So thank you all for coming. I'm very excited to be able to do this and to host Topher for these couple of nights during his trip to America. Um, and I wanted to get started. Some of you have seen the documentary. Some of you have seen other parts of his presentation. But um, seeing the person in flesh makes it more real. And Topher is on a mission to empower people to have a better response when things like COVID happen. And so what I'd like to do is, I'm gonna do a little bit of a Q&A with Topher, and then I'd love to open it up for questions, um, even maybe coming back after lunch, uh, sure. if you guys wanna continue eating, but also ask questions. No dessert for you. Um, so I, trust me, I do not need it. <laughs> so to start with, let's start at three weeks into the pandemic. Right. So. Largely everything started the way it would have for you. You hear that there's this virus. Some people are saying it's gonna be huge. Some people are saying it's gonna blow over. We've, had, we've seen SARS, we've seen MERS, we've seen swine flu, all those things. Most of them blew over without a lot of drama. And then all of a sudden in Australia, it was announced that we were locking down. The idea was uh, the same, I believe, as what was said to all of you. Two weeks to, to stop the spread or slow the spread. Two weeks to flatten the curve. These sorts of ideas. We need to buy some time to give the medical industry, the, the hospitals, etc., an opportunity to gear up and to respond. And that's what was sold to us. And then all of a sudden they said, just one more week. And instantly I knew. Instantly there was something about the way all of that unfolded. I understood exactly what lay before us. And so in the third week of lockdowns in Australia, when they'd extended it for the very first time, I released a video. And in that video, I said, I volunteered to be infected with the coronavirus. Now that wasn't just clickbait. 
there is actually, there's a good epidemiological reason why you would do that. You'd take someone like me, who based on the data was very low risk from COVID, not zero risk, but very low risk. And if all of the me's of the world went and got it and quarantined where we wouldn't pass it on to anybody else and then re-emerged once we had immunity, then we could protect the vulnerable, protect the elderly and get out of lockdowns. My fear was that the lockdowns were gonna keep us in the pandemic rather than getting us through it. No. Yeah, no, I know, right? <laughs> and then of course it became another week and another week and my video fell on deaf ears, um, but I was then invited to speak at the very first anti-lockdown protest as a result of that video, because someone had seen that video and they had the guts to organize a protest, an illegal protest. So at 38 years of age, I walked out my door to become a criminal for the first time in my life. I have the cleanest criminal record you could possibly imagine. I'm, I'm ex-defense force with, a, with an honorable discharge. I've only ever had positive interactions with police. I've never even lost my license for crying out loud. And then I walked out my door to become a criminal that day. Hence your book, Good People Big. Break bad laws. Oh, Thank, Thank you, Hercules, for the for the plug. I appreciate the check is in the mail. <laughs> Topher has four books to give away to the best questions. <laughs> I wish I'd brought more, but I had limited baggage. <laughs> Which will be determined at the end of the session today. So so now I want to go into the the personal mm. cost of mm. the lockdowns. So do you want to talk about yourself or do you want to talk about the, the young woman who was the, the solo entrepreneur who was told that she was non-essential? I'm aware that there are people in the room who may not have any idea of really what, what went on in any sort of detail, so I might start there. Yeah. So what, what did lockdowns mean for us? Lockdowns meant that oh. we were not allowed to leave our house for 23 hours a day. Uh, so effectively house arrest. We were all criminals, found guilty of a crime and put under house arrest. You could leave your house for up to one hour, but there had to be what was deemed to be a legitimate excuse. And there was a list of things. You could go shopping for essential items only. So there were stores that you would walk into and you would try and buy things and they'd say, you can have these things, but you're not allowed to buy those because they haven't been deemed as essential. And that include by, included, by the way, clothing. So if your kids outgrew Clothing's their clothing. Not essential. Yeah, if, that, if, <laughs> if your kids outgrew their clothing over the 18 oh, months of lockdowns, 18 right? months. Now, it was on and off. It wasn't continuous right. the whole time. But at its worst, uh, non-essential businesses were closed down. And just think about the psychological impact on an entrepreneur, or a small business owner, a, a contractor who has poured their heart and soul into their business. And suddenly, they're just on this list that says, you're non-essential. That's so much more than a business that's being impacted at that point. That's an identity that's being impacted. Schools were closed. Children lost a year's worth of their, uh, of their, excuse me, of their education during these lockdowns. We had, a <laughs> I was homeschooled, I was homeschooled, so I'm actually, I'm actually with Sam on this, uh, but unfortunately it wasn't replaced with anything of substance. And the parents in the homes that they were staying home in, of course, were under the duress of themselves being locked down. Parents are losing money, potentially losing the house, marriages are breaking up. And like, it got to the point where we had an 8 p.m. curfew in place, where you could not leave your property after 8 p.m., in addition to all of these other restrictions. And they were enforcing these rules with absolute heartless and, frankly, reckless enthusiasm. So there were people who were fined. Who was enforcing the rules and how were they being enforced? So the Victoria Police uh, were, were just doing their jobs. We've all, we're all familiar with that phrase, I'm sure and I don't make the rules, I just enforce them. All of those excuses were, were being rolled out by Victoria Police. If you, if you were caught taking your bin to the curb so that the, the, it could get picked up in the morning after the 8 p.m. curfew, you got arrested. Wow. Um, yeah, we ended up with a situation where the, the police raided a house where they believed. If, was there any place in Australia that was like Florida here where like DeSantis didn't really that's a, that's a great question. No, there was no equivalent, but it is worth me saying, I'm talking about Melbourne specifically, and we went completely mad, and that's not representative of most of the rest of Australia. We, we were an outlier. They up a barrier in, in the city you were not allowed to cross. It was you, yeah, it was the, called the Ring of Steel, and we had military on checkpoints doing papers, please. And you had to show that you had paperwork to document that you had an excuse to move from one area to another, otherwise you weren't, and you'd be arrested if you weren't found to have a, a good enough excuse. In fact, there's a story of a young boy who did not get medical care because they didn't have the paperwork to cross the barrier yeah. to yeah. get him to the hospital in time. When, when I say heartlessness, it's to the point that, uh, that we know of four children died unnecessarily due to medical neglect. 
So when I say it was heartless, it was absolutely heartless. There was no respect for human life at all. But it was all done under the guise of for your, for your health. What about a job? How did people work? So, so a lot of people couldn't. And what happened very quickly was my inbox began to fill with, um, <coughs> with basically desperate people people that had lost their incomes, lost their identities, were losing their homes because they were deemed non-essential and they couldn't work. And uh, they were locked at home and any time they spoke up, their friends and families, their, their, their pastors of their churches, shamefully, uh, their mental health counsellors would say, sit down, shut up, it's for your own good, it's for your health. Well, it's not, it's killing me. Sit down, shut up, you don't understand, we're saving grandma. It was heartless at every level of society. And because I spoke at that very first anti-lockdown rally and I, I live streamed that and that went viral, it had 100,000 views by the, you know, by the ne next day, people began to reach out to me. And you've got to remember, I'm not a big public figure. I was a minor public figure at the time, but I, I'm, I'm, I don't have resources to help people. Someone who's going bankrupt isn't reaching out to me because they think I can pay their bills for them. They're reaching out to me because they've given up on finding a solution and they just need someone to... Oh. Wow. I, have, I have a quick question. What happened to the other countries like England or even the U.S.? Mm. Why did we not come down? We didn't even know. No, about no, it. it wasn't help. It, it was their own government. It was our own government. It, it's that was none doing of our this. business what their government does and, and to let's their be people honest. until until it becomes in a, in essence like a humanitarian issue where the U.S. government says, "Oh, this is right," but this is Australia. They, they're they're basically a clone of of in a sense U.S. you know hybridized with England. Mm. How could this happen Quick in a question. civilized... They did, they did somewhat similar things in New York City. Mm. Yes, they did. Mm. So, so but it, but it didn't reach, it, it didn't quite reach this level. That's why we're talking yeah, about this. Talk about the riots and everything yeah. Well, hang on. There were no riots. I want to be really clear about this. We, right. no, we no, never rioted. There were, there, were there were protests. protests. What you would probably call rallies. In the American vernacular, you'd call it a rally. Uh, we weren't burning buildings down and saying it was mostly peaceful, okay? That's not us. That's a uniquely American phenomenon. <laughs> well, thank goodness for that. <laughs> yeah, and, and not all American. You're absolutely it's right. True. It's one side of America. Um, so I then was involved in a growing protest movement. Now, these protests were illegal. I don't, I don't believe that's a thing. I don't think protests can be illegal, but that's what they were declared as. And Victoria Police, with some glee, would come out with batons and tear gas and, and pepper spray and try and enact mass arrests. They would try and kettle us as a group, so they'd block off all the possible ways out. And then they would send in teams of full body armour, heavily armed people, uh, and they would grab people one at a time quite violently. Some, some of our protesters were hospitalised just in the process of being arrested. Uh, and they would drag them off, get their ID and their, their identification, stick them in a cell and then come and get the next person. And they'd be kettled, or we would be kettled for hours at a time potentially, waiting for them to just come and pick off one person at a time for, for processing. It's the most Orwellian thing you, could, you can imagine. But then ultimately, that didn't kill the movement. People kept coming back despite the arrest, despite the violence. And our numbers started to grow beyond 10,000. So we started with 70 at that very first protest where I spoke. And uh, we began to surpass, and this is now fast forwarding 18 months of suffering. I cannot begin to tell you the, how, how just the whole soul of my city was destroyed over those 18 months. We got to the point though where the movement grew to having 10,000 people and by now people knew the risk they were taking. They knew the physical danger they were in as well as obviously the legal danger and the court cases and everything else that would come out of it. So these are 10,000 incredible people and the Victorian government realised they were losing control of the situation and our numbers were still growing and that's when they began to shoot us with rubber bullets. And again... I have to point out, <coughs> there's a misconception that rubber bullets are non-lethal. Mm. They're not non-lethal, they are less lethal. Yes. But They're they can unlikely certainly to kill be you. Yeah. lethal. Yeah. Properly placed can definitely be lethal. Yeah. And they shot indiscriminately into the crowd. In the end, wow. in the end, the, the most heinous violation of human rights throughout this whole story was when a, a large group of protesters were basically chased out of the city by the anti-terror squad. They had an armoured vehicle, they had uh, fully armed people with live ammunition in their weapons, which thankfully they never used, but they would jump off and tackle people and literally start striking people with the butt of their weapon while they're on the ground having just been tackled by multiple police. We've got all of this on video, it's in my documentary Battleground Melbourne, it's all there, you can see it, it's real. And so we were chased out of the city and we ended up going to a place called the Shrine of Remembrance, it's a war memorial. And 
we didn't want to be there that day. It's, a, it's hallowed ground. It's not a place that you should do that sort of thing. But we ended up there as almost taking refuge. And there's a, 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 a journalist, Rukshan Fernando, a citizen journalist who'd become very, very big during that time. And he was always live streaming these protests. And he stuck the camera in my face while I was standing there in front of the Shrine of Remembrance. And he said, Topher, help people understand why are we, why are we here? And I replied, I said, look, it wasn't our intention to come back here, but when they're chasing you through the streets with the anti-terror squad and the bear cat, and they're using that level of violence and they're labeling political opponents of the government as terrorists, we had no choice but to come here and appeal to our, appeal to our ancestors. So for me, let me ask a question. Uh, I, I, it's commendable. It's actually bringing me to tears. I grew up in a military family, mm. and we saw this. We saw what communism looks like. It's not just who has guns and who doesn't. It's a complete strip of your humanity. So yeah. my question is, uh, do you see the did you see the parallels then of the psyop between the government saying you're too big, you can't beat us, we're stronger, and mm. what did you tell yourselves? You don't have F-14s, out? isn't that what uh, somebody <laughs> said? You don't have an F-14. It's yeah. a psychology that they, they work on first to bring oh, yeah. you psychologically of, that you won't fight back, and then they strip the rest of your humanity from yeah. you. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of that. I'll, I'll come to the psychological side in a moment, but I want to I finish that anecdote about the, the yeah. Shrine of Remembrance. I said, we had no choice but to come here and appeal to our ancestors and appeal to the freedoms that they fought for and they died for, and we built this building to remember them for, but those freedoms are being denied from their children and their great-grandchildren right now. And I, I left the area shortly afterwards because I could see what was coming. And the, there were, the protesters were very hot-headed that day. We'd recently had an influx of new hot-headed uh, young male protests, uh, protesters from a, a union that had become angry. And they weren't listening to me. They didn't respect any of the people that had led the movement for 18 months where they'd kept working because they were, they, were, they were considered essential. And then all of a sudden when they weren't anymore, they arced up and they weren't listening to me or anybody else and they were, um, they were angry. And I could see this was, gonna, this was gonna go badly. So I left. And about a half hour after I left was when the police just lined up. And these, these people were not committing any crimes. They were not violent, they were not anything. They were shouting slogans. And the police lined up, lifted up their, their rubber bullet guns and they began to advance and they just began to fire. Anyone random, just literally indiscriminately firing potentially lethal ammunition at people. There, the, there were no children there that day. Thank God for that. By then the, the, by then, the police violence had escalated to the point that no one was bringing children anymore. That was in the streets previously as they were escalating the violence and yeah, a child got, got very badly injured. Talk a little bit about, uh, if I'm not taking you too far off track, no, no. the pyramid. Ah, Maslow's hierarchy, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And this comes back to your, your comment around the psychology. Let me, let me, let me dive into that. You, you'd all be familiar, at least at some level, with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is something you would have seen in high school or university. Essentially, it's a triangle. Down the bottom is your most basic human needs. You need oxygen, you need water, you need shelter, you need food. At the top is like living your best life, where you have a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, uh, a sense of hope, a sense of love in your life. It's like living your best life. And in between is sort of this progression. For example, if you're sitting there going, mm, I'm not very happy with my job, that's an indication that you've achieved a certain level of comfort, right? Someone who's hungry doesn't ask themselves whether they like their job. You're part way up the pyramid by the time you're asking yourself that question. So the reality is that in the Western world, most of us are clumped together approximately around the middle of that, of that hierarchy. We're not desperate for our survival, nor are we living our best lives every single day and having the most incredible time. What happens when lockdowns come along is everyone who's deemed non-essential, everyone who's self-employed, everyone who runs their own business, everyone who's a casual, is shoved down closer to the bottom of that hierarchy than they've possibly ever been in their life. Suddenly they're worried about their survival in a way they may never have been before, not to mention the impact on their identity and other things. But what happens to the other half of people is even more interesting. Because not only you know, if you're a laptop worker or deemed to be essential or you're on a fixed income from retirement or something like that, you're not financially impacted. You're not worried about your survival. But it gets even better for you. Because in Victoria, our state premier, that's like a governor in, in, the, in the US, he was on television holding a one hour press conference every day for 140 days straight. And he was aiming that press conference at those people. And he was using slogans like, staying apart keeps us together. Staying home saves lives. All of this Orwellian language. 
And he was appealing to these people saying, we are in the fight of the century. This is a once in a century pandemic and we are waging war. And if you're one of the people doing the right thing, then thank you. You are playing your part in winning this war. And if your neighbors are some of the people doing the wrong thing, then they're evil and you should call the, the, the dob in line and dob them in. Okay, this is coming from our premier in 100, 140 sequential press conferences. Every day. And he did a beautiful thing from a, from a political By point of view. By the way, you're this. locked down, so what are you doing? Watching television. Right. right. What are the gun laws? We'll, we'll, we can get to that in a minute. So what... <laughs> Stuart's getting two books now. <laughs> what, what happens psychologically for those people that are not pushed to the bottom of that hierarchy is they're being invited to the top. The They're being invited the to feel a sense of purpose and belonging and meaning. And that's why when you talk to these people, especially in Australia, and you challenge them and say, look, lockdowns were too much. For them, you're not challenging the policy. You're calling into question the best years of their life where they have never had a sense their of belonging. Purpose. They've never had a sense of, of meaning in their life like that ever before. And in their hearts, they know they never will again. For them, that's a golden era. And that's why this divide became so strong. Because it was so easy to be so great, such yeah. a great human being, saving grandma just by sitting at home on my butt. And all, you had, all you had to do was put a ring up on, your, on your, your Facebook picture that said, you know, I've been jabbed or staying home saves lives or these various things like this. And they could virtue signal. It was, it was slacktivism on steroids yes. is what it was. Yeah. And psychologically, it's, a, it's an incredible uh, psyop that they, that they pulled off there. We went through a lot of censorship here in mm. the States, and a lot of that can't be accomplished without censorship. What have mm. you experienced? If it's the right time where you want to Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so the censorship was massive. So people who talked about protests, people who encouraged people to protest were, were often had their, having their pages deleted from social media. Uh, at the behest of the government, we found out later, the Australian government through its... Um, no! Yeah, I know, right? I know. Uh, that would never happen here because you're the land of the free, right? Um, <laughs> So we know, we know that just on Twitter, there were 4,213 occasions where the Australian government requested information to get taken down. And Twitter complied on almost every occasion. This is pre-Elon Musk, obviously. But that included speeches given by our elected parliamentarians in parliament. And that video was getting censored by the government. So here we have direct political censorship in the name of, of oh. medical misinformation in the name of keeping you safe. Oh, so if you had a parliamentarian who questioned something of which about there the were vaccine a few. or whatever. Yeah, of which and there, there were, were a few. few. Yeah, they were too few. Then literally, we weren't allowed to see what they said in parliament. Our elected representatives, it went to that level with the censorship over there. There were videos that came out, I don't know if you can comment on that too, that I, I wasn't able to verify. One of them being put in camps if you refuse to take it mm. in quarantine, and one of a child oh, yes. being dragged out of the house and forced vaccinated. Yeah, the, it's very difficult to get to the, the source of a lot of those sorts of things. I never got to the source of the one with the child, so I, I just can't comment, I don't know. When it comes to the camps, it's a little more complicated than that. So the camps were, were built as quarantine camps and they would, they would keep you there waiting to see if you had symptoms after you'd arrived from overseas or something like that. And if you refused to take the swab tests, then you would end up in essentially solitary confinement. Um, and, and so there were camps, they were ready to start imprisoning essentially people that, that didn't get the jab. We never quite got to that point. And I think honestly, the only reason we didn't get to that point was because the movement was growing, the, the pushback was growing, the protests were growing. And if they'd begun to do that, I think they understood that, that our movement would have, would have yes. escalated massively. Okay, so, so sum up for us the, the, the memorial mm. day, that was a turning point. It was a turning point. So what happened that day was, the, the, at that point, Victoria Police had literally used everything short of live ammunition. The only escalation left for them was live ammunition. And what had been happening over the 18 months was they would keep escalating the violence and then we would keep changing our tactics and coming back anyway. And now we're at the point where the next ex escalation, somebody dies. That was very, very clear. The, what, what are they, and it, it wasn't, it was going to be a protester and not a policeman. It was going to be policeman. a protester, yeah, 100%. Um, so the very next day I got in the car and I went close to the city waiting to see and hear word of something starting because I was going to go, <laughs> sorry, saying goodbye to your wife and kids, walking out the door. That was a tough day. Um, 
So I'm waiting and I'm watching and I'm hoping that someone starts something because there's no point, you know, you, some, someone's got to go first and then everyone else can pile in, but you're just waiting for that, that person. What does that mean? I'm sorry, someone starts something. Courage is contagious. Well, courage is contagious, but also let's, let's take a, a slightly different scenario where, where a, a protest has been publicised and we said, we're going to protest at this location at this time. The police, of course, are there, are there waiting for us. They've got the, the riot police guys, they've got the mounted uh, police, they've got you know, anti-terror squad, they've got it all there. And they're waiting, they're arrayed and, and on the ground and ready. And we're all kind of skulking around in the distance and we're, we're recognising each other and identifying who each other are. And we're like, okay, I reckon we've got at least a thousand of us here now. But while we're distributed, the police can't do anything. Right. Someone has to get out in the middle and wave a flag or, or shout through a megaphone Call or do something for the rest of us to react to. It's our signal, but it's not a prearranged signal, it's an organic one. And so we need that to happen. Someone's got to go first. And then we can all pile in and we've got to try and get there fast enough that the police can't just run them down with the horses or something like that, just to stop that moment from succeeding. So we were, we were constantly evolving our tactics to, to actually have that moment happen because without that moment, you never had a protest. So in this particular case, I'm waiting for someone to start something and then, and then for someone to start a live stream so I know about it. And I was gonna just drive like a man and, and try and get there. And what happened that day, sorry, the reason why I'm emotional here is because this is one of the most, you said the second most beautiful moment of this entire ordeal. What happened was nurses and teachers in uniform, put on their uniforms, and stood in a park, socially distanced, wearing masks from each other, silently, and they simply wrote on their uniforms how many years they'd been a teacher. And an anecdote or something about the impact of the lockdowns on them, or the fact that they were losing their job because of the vaccine mandates, or something that a student had said to them. That's all it was. And all of a sudden this live stream comes on, and it's these, these, these teachers and these um, ambulance, uh, these nurses. And the police, of course, showed up basically immediately, riot squad, you know, they're bringing in the trailers with the horses and they're ready to go, they're ready to rumble. And they've stepped out and, and remember where we are, this is the day after, like only 12 hours earlier, they were shooting rubber bullets at people. So they've showed up in the morning and finally, I think, with what had happened the day before at the shrine, as they stood there and they looked at a bunch of young women, socially distanced, wearing masks, saying nothing, just standing there like statues. Finally, their conscience did what it should have done 18 months earlier. Mm. And I said, we can't do this. And it was within a week of that day that the police actually wrote a letter to the Premier and leaked it to the press deliberately, saying, we're done. It's time to put away the tear gas. We're not going to keep on cracking down on these protests. And after, and after 18 months, and who knows how many hospitalizations and all kinds of human rights abuses, we finally shamed the, the Victoria Police into doing what they should have done on day one. Um, was that the answer to you? I, I forget the question now, I'm sorry. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> I have a little question about that. Um, obviously, the opposition, the, or, you know, the system was very organized and communicated. The, on, on, on the folks that were just trying to survive, were you able to organize and communicate? Because one of the things that we struggle with is Trying to organize and communicate, yeah. you know, resistance. It was a mess to start with, but then over time, organically, a, a certain structure kind of emerged. There were three key groups that would organize protests between them, and initially they all suspected each other and accused each other of being controlled opposition and what have you, and then they gradually figured out, actually, we're all here for the right reason, so let's just work together. Um, communications channels on Telegram, and, and, and a lot of people migrated to Telegram because on, if a group on Facebook wouldn't survive more than, more than a day or two, these sorts of things. So there was a very organic process of discovery in all of that. Um, and yes, in the end, we had a reasonably sophisticated way of communicating with each other. And we knew that everything we said to each other was also seen by the police. And we just factored that into the way that we communicated with each other. Um, and so everyone would just be on a channel. So if, if we knew that a protest was coming up, everyone would be on a channel waiting. And then the organizers, which we all knew the username of the organizers, no one knew you who they were. Or, you know, usually it was a conglomerate, a group of people working together. Uh, at an appointed time, they would tell us where they were going. And that'd be, you know, we would all be in the vicinity of the city and we'd have half an hour to get to that location. And that gave the police minimal time <clears throat> to be set up, etc. So I an do, organic system formed. I do want to talk briefly um, about your personal experience because um because you want to make me cry i want to make you cry <laughs> um i i i i want this group to understand um the personal cost 
Yeah. That you... So, so that, I, I have to rewind for that to immediately after uh, I spoke at that very first protest and people began reaching out to me for help. People began saying, hey, you know, I'm losing my mind, I'm losing my marriage, my wife thinks I'm crazy, you know, my kids hate me, all of the impacts that were happening because people had just been divided like that. And all the people that weren't affected, they, they were so sure that they were right and they were so self-righteous and they had no patience or tolerance at all for anyone who reached out, put their hand up and said, hey, but I'm suffering over here. You there just was, want to kill grandma. There was no tolerance for them at all. And so, and so they'd reach out to me even though they knew I couldn't fix anything. They reached out to me because they'd really, they'd given up. On, on, on finding a solution. And there were so many, there were dozens a day, and I realized I needed to go through my entire inbox on YouTube and, and on um, my emails and on Facebook and everywhere else every single day because there'd be messages of, of support in there as well, but there were also some really desperate people that just needed to be heard. They needed someone to respond. So I began to do that every day and it began to really impact me psychologically. Let's not forget, at the time I was, you know, I was locked down as well. My business was going under because it couldn't survive the, the lockdown situation. My wife was pregnant with our second child. I've got, a, I've got a four year old who's full of beans and full of energy and locked in the house 23 hours a day. And I'm trying to be a freedom fighter by day and, and quite literally risking my neck with Victoria Police by day and then trying to be a suicide counselor by night. And I moved my office into the garage because I, I knew it was affecting me and I, I moved away from the kids and away from, from my wife while I was doing this and I put, I put Winston, our oldest, to bed and I would go into the garage and I would start trying to reply to these people and let them know that someone heard and cared. And over time, I began to develop a real anxiety around refreshing my inbox because of the stories that I was reading. And what really began to set it off was when I, the first time, and this happened four times in the end, but the first time I got word that someone who I'd been trying to support had ended it. So I began to drink because a glass of wine would help to settle the nerves and enable me, you know, just take the edge off and now I could click the button to refresh and face whatever lay within. But the symptoms continued to escalate. You know, I ended up with four people that I know of who went through with taking their own lives. And I ended up drinking more and more just as a, as a, as a crutch. It escalated to the point that I would drink an entire bottle of wine and a half a bottle of whiskey in a night, just trying to not feel. That's the well, coping I was, mechanism. I was just trying to not feel, you know? It's not that I didn't want to care for these people, but I knew that I, I didn't have the capacity anymore. So I eventually realized and what happened was added to that was the growing knowledge that my arrest was inevitable. Sooner or later they were coming for me and we were watching violent arrests. They were using battering rams, smashing through people's doors, tackling them to the ground. These are not people accused of violent crimes. These are not drug kingpins. Uh, these are people accused of Facebook posts, right? And the arrests were often quite violent and people were getting hospitalized. And we taught my son, who was four, to, to not answer the door and he would have to, when the, there was a knock on the door, he had to go to the back of the house not to the front, because we didn't know what came after the knock. And as I understood that my arrest was coming and that was related to Monica Smith, an incredibly courageous young woman who spent 22 days in prison for Facebook posts, most of that in solitary confinement because she refused to get tested, um, I understood that my arrest was coming and, and I, I, by then I was on the verge of a breakdown because not only was I sitting up all night giving myself a hangover and anxiety and trying to deal with all of that, I was then waking up very early in the morning because the first time a car door closed on the street, I'd be wide awake going, is that the cops? Am I about to get raided now? Is this it? And then I'd be waiting, is an engine going to start? Because if an engine starts, that's someone going to work. Okay, it's fine. But if I hear multiple car doors and I'm not hearing an engine yet, I'm up and I'm looking through the curtains to see what's out there. And I realised I was coming apart at the seams. I was just, I was having a breakdown. And I went to my wife and she obviously knew. <laughs> it, wasn't a, it wasn't a secret at that point, but she knew me well enough to know not to push. And, and she, le she let me go through that journey and, and get to the point where I was coming to her and saying, hey, I'm, this is where I'm at. And so we talked and she reminded me of something that I said to her when I, the day I proposed. And I said to her, one thing you need to understand that I need to be upfront about is that I genuinely expect that I will go to prison someday because of my work. That's, that's, I can see the way the world is going and I know who I am and I'm not going to back down from a fight and sooner or later we're, we're going 
it's, it's just going to happen someday. And she looked at me in the eye that day and she said, just make sure I know who to call. So you better believe I proposed, right? And, and, and we're married, obviously. And we remembered, as we, as we talked about what was happening, we remembered that. And I realized I hadn't told her who to call when I got arrested. We hadn't made a plan. So we sat down and we made a four page plan with a whole range of different scenarios. What if, what if I'm killed? What if I'm in hospital? What if I'm just gone and she doesn't know where I am? What if, et cetera. You're arrested. And then all of the branching possibilities under that. What if they, you know, they're gonna hold me indefinitely? What if they release me, et cetera, all the different things. Turned into a four page, page plan that had people's names, phone numbers, and the reason why we were gonna call them or the reason why she needed to call them so that she, all she had to do was just work through that list. And that was a massive weight off my shoulders. That, from a psychological perspective, that was the beginning of me coming back from the edge of a, of a breakdown. Um, and then ultimately when I was arrested, um, I was actually very, very fortunate. And uh, the arrest was actually very, 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 very gentle in comparison to most. How and I was- longer after that did the arrest occur? Only a matter of a few weeks. Yeah, like it was very obvious it was not going to be long now and I was going to get arrested. So it was funny because I met Topher at the conference in London where he interviewed me. Mm. And we had this lovely conversation, nice interview, and then at the end of the interview, uh, the camera gets shut off and he says, by the way, I should tell you that I'm, I'm a arrested, I'm a wanted man in Australia, I'm a criminal. I was still and... fighting the criminal charges at that point, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, well, thanks for being upfront about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. That's for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Should so, I save that for the second date, do yes, you think? Is that maybe a bit too, you know? So we're going we're gonna to eat, start eating Yeah. Uh, because they're serving food. No, please, please don't wait for me. And start. Um, before we start eating, I would love for you to tell them the um, joke that you told us yesterday. Because oh, I really? I think that's a lovely oh, wow. way to leave off uh, while we wow. eat our food. You're, Lighten the mood a little bit. You're brave. Um, so... I was thinking through the fact that the world went mad. The world just went completely, completely crazy. And we saw all sorts of things that we would never have thought that we would see in our lifetimes. And uh, I'll embellish it a little more by talking about the fact that in Australia, you had to have a jab and be vaccinated in order to go to a place called the Buchan Caves. Now, as the name would imply, these are caves in a place called Buchan. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, they are caves in the truest sense of the word. There is dirt above you, there is dirt beneath you, and there is dirt on three sides of you, and then there's a little bit of light over there. That's what this was, okay? You weren't, it was classified as an indoor venue, so you weren't allowed to visit the Bucket and Caves unless you were vaccinated, which makes me wonder what they were worried about. They thought we were gonna give the virus back to the bats. <laughs> At some point, we've lost our minds, right? At some point, we've just gone too far. You know, and I, I realized, I realized we just, you know, it wasn't that the world had gone completely mad, it was that the world had completely rebranded. We were calling things different things now. You see, it used to be that when someone with a penis would follow a 12-year-old girl into a bathroom, we'd call them a pervert. Thank you. Now we call them stunning and brave, right? We rebranded them. We gave them stunning and brave, right? That's what they call transgenders, transgenders now, right? And you don't have to have had the surgery, but all of a sudden you can now just walk into the bathroom. It used to be that when someone ran around selling fake cures to common diseases, we called them a snake oil salesman. Correct. Now we call them Pfizer, okay? <laughs> and all of a sudden, all of a sudden the world made perfect sense for me and I, it just clicked, it's all about rebranding. And I got to thinking, we could learn from that. Like think about Harvey Weinstein, right? He had the worst brand ever. He was branded as a, rape, a rapist because of what he did, right? He was coercing these girls into doing all sorts of horrible things. I thought, this is brilliant. He doesn't have to have that brand for the rest of his life. He can rebrand himself. He's just got to call himself the original, no jab, no job. That's <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, see that's what, that's what it does. And the reason why I said you're brave, so I used that in an introduction at an event in Australia. There's 300 people in the room and it just sucked the oxygen out of the room and put everyone on edge, which is fantastic. From an MC's point of view, I could work with that from there. But so uh, there you go. You can, if you didn't like that, you can blame Sam. Well, thank you for watching another episode of the Aussie Wire News. I hope you enjoyed that front row seat to a closed door event where I got to present to some very interesting people. I can't tell you who was in the room, but you would have seen a few of them. And uh, they asked some very interesting questions and certainly showed a great deal of interest in our story. Hopefully what this is gonna to lead to is more opportunities to be able to get in front of the public rather than small private meetings, get into some larger public contexts and begin to educate Americans and help them to be able to prepare so that when they get tested in the same way that we did during COVID,
that they can overcome that and hang on to what's left of their freedom and even rebuild that and start to reclaim what's been lost. That's my objective with events like that anyway, and I hope at the very least, even if you disagree with that objective, at the very least, I hope you found that insightful. My name's Topher Field. You can follow The Aussie Wire by following at The Aussie Wire on all of our socials. Go to our website, theaussiewire.com. You can find all of our past episodes of The Aussie Wire News, including the last three specials that we've done with interviews from the Students for Liberty, LibertyCon up in Washington, D.C. You can also become a insider. That's a financial supporter of The Aussie Wire News through the link that is in the description. Now, our insiders get early access to special episodes and to our weekly deep dives, and they also get giveaways and various other incentives but they also get the knowledge that they're financially helping us and making it possible for us to keep doing what we do. So to our existing insiders, thank you so much. To our new insiders, thank you so much as well. Well, that completes this trip. I'm back in Australia for our next episode and the Aussie Wire News will resume business as usual in the format that you've known and loved since May of last year. Can you believe we are are very quickly approaching our first birthday already? So thank you so much for your support. My name's Topher Field and this is the Aussie Wire.